Good evening. I'm Christy Max Williams, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the spring season of this, the 25th year of the Arts Cafe Mystic. Thank you. For those of you somehow new to the Arts Cafe, our mission is to present the nation's most celebrated poets and writers, along with New England's best musicians, in programs that lift your spirits as they deepen your minds. And if we have a little fun along the way, huh, well, you'll get over it. <laughs> in celebrating our silver anniversary, we have sought to present poets and musicians who have a special relationship with the Arts Cafe. Mark Doty is one such. And with your indulgence, I'd like to recount a little story about him. A decade ago, immediately before Mr. Doty would read at this podium, I announced to that night's audience that it would be the Arts Cafe's final program. It's true. At the time, which was, you'll recall perhaps, the early throes of the Great Recession, the Arts Cafe was partnering with the town of Groton, which was providing a third of our funding. We had been informed that by the town that that funding could no longer continue. At the same time, uh, this shouldn't surprise, the region's foundations also notified us that they could no longer provide us grants. The Arts Cafe was broke and dead in the water. Following that announcement of our imminent demise, Mr. Doty, who had just won the National Book Award for Poetry, stood here and asserted to that night's audience that the Arts Cafe should not end that a way should be found to sustain it. He spoke on our behalf with simple eloquence and evident passion. In the wake of Mr. Doty's remarks, members of this audience came together to begin a process of reconstituting the Arts Cafe as its own independent nonprofit org, funded by your generosity. I'm here to say that the Arts Cafe is alive and well. And for that, we owe Mark Doty a great debt of thanks. So, on with our show. As tonight's opening voice, we're delighted to welcome back the poet John L. Stanisi. Mr. Stanisi makes his home in Coventry, up there in Connecticut's quiet corner, by Wom Gum Bog Lake. Have I got that right? <laughs> Where he teaches at Manchester Community College. But there is nothing quiet about the corner where he makes his poems. Mr. Stanisi has been named New England Poet of the Year, and his much anthologized poetry was featured by Garrison Keeler on NPR's Writer's Almanac. This summer, we'll see the publication of his sixth book of poems called Sundowning. Though John Stanisi's artistic curiosity roams widely, he is a poet of the heart. In particular, he writes brave poems of love and loss of family, including the familial bonds we all share with the natural world. These are deceptively plain-spoken poems, but there's no mistaking their emotional power and command of narrative. The poems about Mr. Stanisi's father in particular seem to me especially poignant. Even at their funniest, and their wisdom has been clearly earned. But I'm eager for you to see for yourself, so won't you please join me in welcoming John L. Stanisi. Thank you very much, Christy. I'm absolutely delighted to be back 
uh, at the Mystic Arts Cafe, and uh, uh, thank you for having me. And thanks uh, to uh, to Mark Jody. I'm quite humbled to be reading alongside you tonight. Thanks so much. Um, my newest book is called Sundowning. It'll be out in July, <clears throat> and I'll read a couple from that book to begin with. Um, the title Sundowning is a reference uh, to the to the increasing agitation experienced by Alzheimer's patients as the day wanes. The, the, the term they use for that agitation is uh, called sundowning. Uh, the first poem I'll read from that uh, upcoming book is called Ascension, and it's for my aunt, uh, Mildred Little Aiello. Uh, she was born on August, uh, I'm sorry, April 16th, uh, 1937. She died February 1st, 2018, one year ago exactly. And the poem is called Ascension. First day of February, and in the far corner of the yard, the Adirondack chair, blown over by the wind at Christmas, is still on its back, the snow too deep for me to traipse out and right it, the ice too sheer to risk slamming these old bones to the ground. In a hospital bed in her bedroom where her bed used to be, and her husband, my aunt keeps reaching up for the far corner of the room, whispering, that is so interesting. I'll go now. In April, I will walk out across the warming grass and right the chair, as if there had never been anything there to stop me in the first place, listening for the buzz of hummingbirds who remind me of how fast things are capable of moving. Uh, some of what we did during my father's tenure struggle with Alzheimer's uh, amid all the frustration and the anger and the confusion was find things to laugh about um, by necessity. Um, and this, this is about one of those moments. This is called Grandpa's Chicken. At my mother's request, I am here to help my father with his special recipe of chicken cutlets dredged in eggs and breadcrumbs and fried in extra virgin olive oil and cloves of garlic bigger than my thumbs. My father has forgotten what to do, which isn't really what the problem is. The problem is that he doesn't know that he doesn't know. Today, in place of oil, he uses water, eliminates the eggs entirely, flops the chicken pieces in a bowl of flour and drops them into the high rolling boil. He becomes annoyed as the water fills with lumps, blames the mess on the faulty stove, the meat, the flour, which isn't as good as it used to be. And my mother says, maybe you can help. <laughs> and so we're in the kitchen cooking together, though my father is distracted, fidgets with his toys, a stuffed squirrel, a plastic army man, the pieces of a puzzle he cannot do. So I forge on and follow his recipe, which begins with turning the burner up to high. The kitchen fills with the scent of garlic as each slab of chicken nearly burned, just this side of black is stacked upon a paper towel that lines a dinner plate. Smoke rises and the smoke detector screeches in the hall, that shrill alarm, that call, Fan the thing with these, it'll stop, he says, handing me a flimsy paper plate. <laughs> and here we are, a pair of awkward birds, one-winged lunkers bound to earth and flapping at the plastic box on the wall near the kitchen sink. But the smoke detector, crazed ventriloquist, sounds to me as if it's down the hall. I let it slide, thinking he must know he does this all the time, this man who pushes puzzle pieces around and cooks on high. In a moment, over the frantic fanning, I hear him say, Johnny, we're fanning the doorbell. <laughs> the smoke detector is down the end of the hall. And we laugh like a couple of kids in church at this bit of clarity, like a vestige of smoke, oily and invisible, something he can taste against his teeth when he rubs them with his tongue, while down the hall, the smoke detector keens. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, last year, I wrote a book called uh, Four Bits, 50 50-word 50 pieces. And um, 
My, my father used to use the term two bits, four bits, and I thought that sounded kind of cool, so I thought I would write a book that has uh, 50 poems, uh, each uh, comprising exactly 50 words. Um, and uh, so the first, the first one I will read is called One. This past summer, we visited Emily Dickinson's homestead, and um, the whole day was incredibly overwhelming for me in, in a really wonderful way. Um, at one point, uh, Carol and I were standing in her bedroom, and I was looking out her window. Uh, and ju just as I looked out her window, a white cabbage butterfly flew out from behind the stone wall in the front of the homestead and began to flit around on the lawn down there. And it was, um, it was as close to a religious experience as, as I've ever had. So, uh, so I wrote a, a, an homage to that moment, and I called the poem One because I figured it would be the first and last time I ever actually tried to imitate Emily Dickinson. Um, it begins with an epigraph uh, from her work. From, uh, it says, from cocoon forth a butterfly as lady from her door emerged a summer afternoon repairing everywhere, Emily Dickinson. I wore shorts, informal, knew you would be gone, summer come, Floral scent, languid on the lawn. I stood at your window, taking in your view. That's when, dressed in cabbage white, lilting wings of tulle, a butterfly spasmodic, dashing in disguise, entirely hypnotic, saying you'd arrived. And then another from the same book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we get great pleasure out of it. We have 10 grandchildren and two great-grandchildren, and I get great pleasure out of saying to them, our house is your house. You know, come, come whenever you want. We don't have to be here. Just, just come play in the pool, have a good time. And so this is, uh, this is another little 50-worder called Grandchildren in the Pool. Come whenever you want. We don't have to be here. A blessing, our house, theirs. Giddy summer laughter. Whirlpool, wild. Too much fun to fight against. Waves of water over the side. I feel peace when I get home, knowing that they've been here. Pizza slices floating in the water. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> um, this book just came out. It's called Chance, and um, it is a... Um, it's a memoir in sonnets, and it's not a very original idea. I got the complete inspiration from my friend Marilyn Nelson. Her, uh, her incredible book called How I Discovered Poetry is exactly that. It's a, it's a, a memoir in sonnets, and so I, uh, uh, with her permission, <laughs> did the same thing. Um, and so this is, this is called Cry to Me, and it's, um, it's about... Um, the complications uh, of a romance in eighth grade. So uh, this is a uh, cry to me for my friend Greg Willett, St. Mary's School, East Hartford, Connecticut, 1962. We walked through some heartache in 62. Gary liked Teresa, but Teresa asked Elizabeth to tell Peter that she really wanted to go out with him, but Peter had been making out with Jane in the theater, celebrating their one-month anniversary, so that was out. And even though Jane broke up with Pete, Peter kept asking Gail to talk to Jane, which Gail wouldn't do because she told Brenda that she thought Peter was cute, but Brenda wasn't listening to a word wrapped up in lonely teardrops shed for Greg. The waters of eighth grade were never still. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Crazy stuff. Um, uh, so I graduated from high school in, in 1967, so I'm one of those kids who grow up with the Vietnam War. Uh, and... Um, uh, my best friend, when, when, when we were getting drafted as seniors, chose to join the Marines instead of uh, getting, allowing us up to, to get drafted. And he, did, he joined the Marines, and he went to Vietnam, and he lasted three weeks. Uh, he was shot by a sniper. Um, uh, and uh, so this is, this is uh, called, I had mailed him some things on the morning of the day that I heard that he had been killed. 
and it's called Box, um, for James Walter Sincere, November 15th, 1949, November 22nd, 1968, Quang Nam Province, Vietnam. I found a box that seemed just the right size to fit both your blue button-down shirts and your battered old copy of Thomas's portrait of the artist as a young dog, stolen inexplicably from the school library at East Hartford High. I think it had to do with your presumption that Bob Dylan and Dylan Thomas had some cosmic connection that included you. I also sent you blonde on blonde that day. I mailed the box at 10 a.m. And by three, Suzanne told me that you were dead. And for years and years, I've wondered who got your box and did they love the things inside? <clears throat> um, on New Year's Eve, this, this past New Year's Eve, just December 31st, 2018, uh, one of my best friends, uh, sons, who was in the Navy, came home uh, by surprise. He wasn't supposed to be home, and he, and he showed up in the middle of the night as a surprise. It was his grandmother's birthday, and, and so it was a wonderful surprise that, that, that he showed up. And the family had a huge feast and, uh, uh, you know, a New Year's dinner, and, uh, and, and they celebrated his grandmother's birthday and, and his being home. And um, at 6.02 in the evening, if you remember that night, it was rainy, and cold uh, and foggy. And at 6.02, he said to his pop, I'm going to surprise Connor. Um, and at 6.09, he was dead. Um, he he uh, hit a telephone pole uh, less than a mile from his house. Uh, and it, it has been uh, since that day, you can imagine what that family is, is going through. Um, so these, these are uh, two poems. Um, the first one is a garland. I'll spare you a long explanation of what a garland is. Um, and then the second is, uh, is a guzzle, and it's, it's a responsorial. It, re it responds to the, to the garland. Um, and uh, and I'll, just, I'll just read both of them back to back. It's called The Fallen Leaves, one. Um, starts with an epigraph uh, that a, from a poem that, my, that, that the boy's dad wrote called Stained Glass. Uh, the world is a shattered pane of stained glass, Sam Norman. And from Amy Clampett's poem called Fog, the nodding campanula of bellboys, the ticking linear filigree of bird voices, the fallen leaves. Others remain after the fallen leaves, and then it's all fog. Everything is fog. And of course, the idea that you are safe is more unreal than that thing you cannot grasp no matter how many decades pass. Would it help to capture fog in a net, harnessed Kamanchaka, the creeping fog that Chilean fog catchers trap and drink? Would that help, that half science, half magic? Or is there nothing that will help you heal? There is something comforting when the light is yellow, billowing despondency that you imagine would glow in a glass an aura around the brokenhearted whose faces you don't need to see to know. The banging halyard in concert with the campanella of bellboys, the language in the mist always urgent, always taut. Even with good news, the voices are tense. When you have nothing left to say, what then? After the crash, after your boy was killed, you became a shattered pane of glass. Sleeplessly unconscious, your words came like shards of January light breaking you. The fragments need shoring, the heart comfort. Others remain after the fallen leaves, harnessing Kamanchaka, the creeping fog that you imagine would glow in a glass. Even with good news, the voices are tense. The fragments need shoring, the heart comfort. And this is the guzzle, the fallen leaves too. And it starts with an epigraph from Emily Dickinson. The things that never can come back are several, childhood, some forms of hope, the dead. The fallen leaves too. 
We cannot blame the fog or blame the fallen leaves. You are just gone. How can we blame the fallen leaves? There was rain that night and fog, and then you vanished. That wasn't fog's plan or the aim of fallen leaves. People milled about in the yellow light of fog, dazed and sad, not seeking the plain of fallen leaves. Mourners bundled in rain gear. I did not know them. They meant well when they came upon the fallen leaves. In your absence, those you love will try to exist. Broken, they embrace the remaining fallen leaves. The tree will still be there and the stones on the road. The same ruts will be there, the same fallen leaves. On the table are strewn a thousand photographs as if the pile had been raked and named fallen leaves. The things that can never come back are several. Some go, others remain after the fallen leaves. And then I'll finish up with a poem called Voices. Um, this, <laughs> this poem is about that disconcerting uh, feeling that, that, that we get when, you know, you suddenly you hear your father's voice coming out of your mouth. <laughs> even, even movements, sayings, it's terrifying in a way. Uh, and and this, this, if you graphed this poem, you would find that that, that they all, the, all of these things connect. It's very strange. Um, so it's called Voices, and it begins with an epigraph from um, Elizabeth Bishop's wonderful poem, In the Waiting Room. Um, she says, what took me completely by surprise was that it was me, my voice in my mouth. She's, she's in the waiting room. She's a little kid, and she hears her aunt Consuela getting a tooth drilled, and her aunt goes, oh! <laughs> and Emily, uh, I mean, Elizabeth doesn't hear her. Her aunt, she hears herself, so uh, this is Voices. There are times when in my mother's voice, her father's voice distracts me from her words. Doppelganger speak in some translation that sounds as if he's simply saying hi, when in truth it is her father come to say in language of the living that he'd like for me to take a moment and to think of all the time we spent in shady joints, our elbows on the sticky wooden bar, the half-light and acrid smell of booze, stale beer, and the years-old reek of smoke. I also hear it when my daughter speaks, my mother's voice addressing me as dad, asking me if I can watch the kids, and when I answer, my aunt, my mother's sister, answers back, but with her father's voice, in which I hear the tinny timber of his eccentric mother, grandma far away, asking me if I'd like some funny water, in a voice that my other daughter borrows to bring me up to speed on all her plans, sounding just like Uncle Rocky did when he'd grin a menacing grin and talk about tennis or bothering girls in the flickering darkness of the theater, and then my boy boy speaks with his brother's voice, but it's my father calling to say his wife is going to have a child, their first. We share the joy with jokes of our advancing age and hopes that it will be a boy to keep our name alive. I smile and clear my throat, but it's my father's throat, my father's cough, and there we are, the living and the dead, the living carrying on as best we can, the dead alive in everything we say. Thank you very much. Thank you. John L. Stanisi, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, John. And yes, we have several of John L. Stanisi's books on sale tonight, including, yes, Ecstasy Among Ghosts and Hallelujah Time and others. As always, all proceeds go to the author. And this gives me a chance to thank our partner, Bank Square Books. Mystic is lucky to have so hip and friendly an independent bookstore. We also want to thank the Mystic Museum of Art for welcoming the Arts Cafe again. Our community is fortunate to have such a resource and we are grateful to be at home here. Tonight, we're privileged to hear one of Johann Sebastian Bach's greatest piano pieces performed by a pianist of national renown on a replica of the very instrument on which Bach composed and probably performed this piece. 
a note about the instrument. This is a forte piano, which your Italian will remind you means loud, soft. This is clearly not the parlor instrument we were all so abusively made to learn as children. <laughs> that instrument properly is called the pianoforte, meaning, of course, soft, loud. Are you taking this in? <laughs> Am I going too quickly? This instrument, the forte piano, was invented in 1698 by the Italian harpsichord maker Bartolomeo Cristofori, which is a wonderful name to say. When Bach died in 1750, there were two of these instruments in his home. Moreover, this is the instrument on which Haydn, Mozart, and the young Beethoven composed their great piano music. What you will hear tonight is the sound they heard. And that sound will be performed by Andrew Willis. We're lucky to catch Mr. Willis on his current tour of the Northeast. Over the years, he's also performed across the nation and in Europe and China. His broad range as a performer has also produced a wonderfully varied discography, including on the first recording of the complete, complete Beethoven sonata cycle on period pianos, which was hailed by the New York Times as hammer clavier of rare stature, which is not easy to say. <laughs> and on this very instrument, Mr. Willis has also recorded all six of Bach's brilliant partitas, or partite, if you prefer, one of which he'll perform tonight. My friends, the Arts Cafe is proud indeed to introduce you to Andrew Willis.
I've been looking forward to this moment. Mark Doty is the sort of poet whose reputation is so immense, he perhaps needs no introduction. But I hope you'll forgive me if I try. Mark Doty is widely regarded as among our nation's best poets. He's certainly one of our most honored poets. His masterwork, Fire to Fire, won the National Book Award. He's also won the National Book Critic Circle Award, the National Poetry Series Prize, and Lambda Literary Award, among many other significant honors. Mr. Doty is also the only American poet to have received the T.S. Eliot Prize, which is the UK's highest honor for a book of poems. Alas, my mistake. Who else? Mm. Both of whom I've read here. Mm. In addition, <laughs> um, Mark Doty has earned acclaim for his five non his five books of nonfiction, including the New York Times bestsellers Dog Ears and Still Life with Oysters and Lemon. A Mark Doty poem is a sort of moment's document in the life of an intelligent heart. These moments are conveyed in a clear, unadorned first-person voice, a voice that feels devoid of poetic tricks, a trustworthy voice whose honesty is meant not to shock, but instead to reflect a process of learning and realization through observation and experience. It's the voice we might want and use to document our own heart story. And Mr. Doty trusts in and depends on the power of stories to convey that heart's experience. Many of this poet's best poems are worked out in, as you'll hear, long sentences whose sinewy syntax make them feel like, like feeling itself, like thought. The paradox of a Mark Doty poem is that on first reading, it seems almost uncrafted. But with each additional reading, it reveals its craft as a subtle but accurate instrument for collecting and organizing observed detail, the kind of detail that makes music of ordinary life. Indeed, Mr. Doty also trusts in and depends on life's details as the structure on which to found the epiphanies that are at the heart of his poems. My friends, it is good luck to have the opportunity to introduce this poet to you. It is even better luck to hear him read his poems. So won't you please join me in welcoming Mark Doty. That was disablingly wonderful. Thank, thank you. Um, it's great to be, be introduced by Christy and also to um, feel that his esteem stretches to my powers of community organization and catalyzation, you know, that, that I somehow had to do with the perpetuation of this terrific series. I, I think I said, come on, you, know, you, you, this, you like this, let's give some money. Um, but I'm delighted that it had an effect, and this is inspiring me to see if I could try that out in some other venues, you know? Um, <laughs> could, could I, if for the groups I visit, could I decide upon something they might want to work on? For instance, uh, impeachment proceedings. Maybe. <laughs> I, I, I try something like that. So uh, I am going to read you a mix of some old, older poems and some new work, and um, I feel like a, a poetry reading should have a, a vestibule, a, an entryway. You know, there should be a sort of pleasant passage to lead you in. So uh, this is that. Uh, for most of my life, my adult life, I have lived with big dogs, with retrievers, and um, a new relationship brought into my life a terrier. Um, and, and what can I say? Uh, I, uh, it was an object of, he was for me an object of study uh, of some mystery and confusion. Um, 
<clears throat> this is called Little George. Barks at whatever's not the world as he prefers to know it. Trash sacks, hand trucks, black hats, canes and hoods, shovels, someone smoking a joint beneath the Haitian evangelicals overhang. Anyone, how dare they, walking a dog. George barks, the tense white comma of himself arced in alarm. At home, he floats in the creaturely domestic, curled in the warm triangle behind a sleeper's knees, wiggling on his back on the sofa, all jelly and thighs, requesting, receiving a belly rub. No worries. But outside the apartment's metal door, the unmanageable day assumes its blurred and infinite disguises. Best to bark. No matter that he's slightly larger than a toaster, he proceeds as if he rules a rectangle two blocks deep, bounded west and east by 7th Avenue and Union Square. Whatever's there is there by his consent. And subject to the rebuke of his refusal, though when he asserts his will, he trembles. If only he were not solely responsible for raising outcry at any premonition of trouble on West 16th Street, or if, right out on the pavement, he might lay down the clanking armor of his bluster. Some evening, when he's climbed the stairs after our late walk and rounds the landing's turn and turns his way toward his steady sleep, I wish he might be visited by a dream of the world as kind, how any looming unreadable might turn out to hold the April green of an unsullied tennis ball. Dear one, surely the future is not entirely out to get us. And if it is, barking won't help much. But no such luck, not yet. He takes umbrage this morning at a stone image serene in a neighbor's garden and stiffens and fixes and sounds his wild alarm. Damn you, Buddha, get out of here, go away. <laughs> so I read that poem this summer. How are we doing here? Okay. I read that poem this summer at the London Buddhist Institute, and I, <laughs> I really, as I started to read it, I didn't think about the seven-foot golden Buddha, which was next to me on the stage. Uh, fortunately, the London Buddhists were very entertained by this spectacle. So uh, I was joking a little bit about community making something happen, but I, I very much believe in the extraordinary capacity we have as a group to make things change. It's very difficult for one person to feel agency in a public way, in a social way. But when we work together, many things can change. And this poem began when a friend of mine, I was living in Provincetown, at the end of Cape Cod. A friend of mine uh, was singing in a choral performance of portions of Handel's Messiah. And you know, this is Provincetown. We didn't really have a, a chorus that could quite pull this off. You know, I didn't think. So I'm walking into the performance, and it's in a Methodist church, and over the steeple is this gorgeous sunset just forming, and inside is the oratorio. And which of those is going to be better? <laughs> eh? Well, but I went to the oratorio. And this is called Messiah Christmas Portions. It'll do for Easter, too. A little heat caught in gleaming rags, in shrouds of veil, torn and sunshot swaddlings. Over the Methodist roof, two clouds propose a Zion of their own, blazing colors of tarnish on copper against the steely clothes of a coastal afternoon, December. While under the steeple, the Choral Society prepares to perform Messiah, pouring in their best blacks and whites onto the rake stage. Not steep, really, but from here, the first pew, they're a looming cloud bank of familiar angels, that neighbor who fights operatically with her girlfriend, for one, and the friendly bearded clerk from the post office, tenor trapped in the body of a baritone, <laughs> altos from the A&P, soprano from the t-shirt shop. Today, they're all poise, costume, and purpose conveying the right note of distance and formality. Silence in the hall, anticipatory as if we're all about to open a gift we're not sure we'll like. <laughs> How could they compete with Sunset's burnished oratorio? Thoughts which vanish when the violins begin. Who'd have thought they'd be so good? Every valley proclaims the solo tenor, a sleek blonde I've seen somewhere before, the liquor store, <laughs> shall be exalted. And in his handsome mouth, the, world, the word is lifted and opened into more syllables than we could count. Central awe dilated in a Baroque melisma, liquefied. 
The poor voice seems to make the unplain landscape the text predicts the Lord will heighten and tame. This music demonstrates what it claims. Glory shall be revealed. If art's acceptable evidence, mustn't what lies behind the world be at least as beautiful as the human voice? The tenors lack confidence, and the soloists, half of them anyway, don't have the strength to found the mighty kingdoms these passages propose. But the chorus, all together, equals my burning clouds and seems itself to burn, commingled powers deeded to a larger, centering claim. These aren't anyone we know. Choiring dissolves familiarity in an uppouring rush which will not rest, will not for a moment be still. Aren't we enlarged by the scale of what we're able to desire? Everything, the choir insists, might flame. Inside these wrappings burns another, brighter life, quickened now by song. Hear how it cascades in overlapping lapidary waves of praise. Still time, still time to change. So this is a poem which um, came about, it's also the poem I want to think about the one and the many, about being singular and being part of a group. And this poem was unusually, it was commissioned by a British foundation called the Gulbenkian Foundation, and they were interested in asking poets to write about uh, issues or, or events in contemporary science that intrigued them. And I chose to think about swarming, about flock behavior, the way that groups of creatures seem to make suddenly taken action as if they'd had a meeting and made a decision or, or that there was some kind of collective agreement. Why can all the geese turn that way at once? Hmm? How do they do that? So uh, this poem, the particular subjects of study in this poem are chickadees, those beautiful little black and white birds which stick around for the winter in the Northeast. And this is called flit. And I need to tell you that this poem contains a word which I cannot pronounce because it is not a word but a clutch of punctuation that is intended to represent the sound a bird would make noticing you. you know, if you could hear that, what that would be like. And I'll just make a gesture when I get there. <laughs> In my dreams, I could speak it. But... Here we go. Flit. Dart, an idea arcs the cold, then a clutch of related thoughts. Slim branches don't even flicker with the weight of what's landed. Animate alphabet whizzing past our faces, a black and white hurry, as if a form of notation accompanied their walk. A little ahead of us accompanied our walk, a little ahead of us and a bit behind. If we could see their trajectory, if their trace remained in the winter air, what a tunnel they'd figure. Skein of quick vectors above our heads, a fierce braid improvised their decisions the way one makes poetry from syntax unpredictable, resolving to wild regularity. Thought has to flit to describe it. Speech has to try that hurry. A scaffolding, a kind of argument about being numerous. Thread and rethread, a light, study. We might be carrying crumbs, we're not, I wish. Their small heads cock, they lift no visible effort as if flight were the work of the will only, light a bit further along, and though they're silent, it seems you could hear the minute repeating registers of their attention. <laughs> the here you are, here, yes, you, yes. Pronoun reference, unclear. <laughs> Who looks at us? An aerial association of a dozen subjectivities or a singular self wearing this snowy afternoon 12 pair of wings? Collectivity of sparks, sparking collectivity. Say live resides not inside skin or feathers, but in the, whir in the whizzing medium, no third person. Sharp, clear globe of January. And we, the 14 of us, the thinking taking place. We is instances of alertness. Grammar help me. Mind in the ringing day. A little of us ahead and a bit behind, and all that action barely disturbs the air. Being numerous is, of course, problematic as well. This poem began when I went into a pet shop in Salt Lake City. A new shipment of goldfish had arrived. It was a big plastic bag which had been lowered into a tank so that the temperature of the water inside and outside of the bag could equalize. 
it was one of the strangest looking things I've ever seen. There was a, a universe of goldfish inside this bag. And uh, I, the poem begins with um, some rather peculiar attempts to describe what that looked like. The name of the store lends the poem its title, which is Fish Are Us. <laughs> clear sack of coppery amp, clear sack of coppery eyebrows suspended in amnion, not one moving. A Mars composed entirely of single lips, each of them gleaming. This bag of fish, have they really traveled here like this? Bulges while they acclimate, presumably, to the new terms of the big tank at Fish R Us. Soon they'll swim out into separate waters, but for now they're shoulder to shoulder in this clear and burnished orb, each fry about the size of this line. Too many lines for any bronzy antique epic, a million of them, a billion incipient citizens of a goldfish Beijing, a Sao Paulo, a Mexico City. They seem to have sense not to move, but hang fire, suspended, held at just a, just a bit of distance, a bit is all there is, all facing outward, eyes they can't even blink, turned toward the skin of the sack they're in, this swollen polyethylene. And though nothing's rippling but their gills, it's still like looking up into falling snow, if all the flakes were a dull, breathing gold, and as if they were streaming toward, not us exactly, but what they'll be. Perhaps they're small enough, live sparks, for sale at a nickel apiece, that one can actually see them transpiring. They want to swim forward, want to eat, want to take place. Who's going to know or number or even see them all? They pulse in their golden ball. So, you can hear how, in that poem, um, you know, it's a playful poem in some ways, but the lyric imagination is sort of turning outward from the self towards what do we do in this situation in which we find ourselves. And the pressure of what Wallace Stevens called, very rightly, the pressure of reality, is one that I think no poet can continue to resist. The world demands to be addressed. We live in times that demand to be addressed. So I'll read you a couple of poems which emerge from recent concerns. Um, this one is really new, so if you get this out of here. I live in a neighborhood in Manhattan where the homeless are particularly visible. And, and one of the things that struck me as I began to really pay attention to them is that I know them much better than my neighbors who have apartments um, because they don't have walls. You know? So you see people conducting their lives, talking to themselves, talking to other people, they're there or not there, uh, eating, sleeping in public. There's one man in particular on, uh, oh, he hangs out at 15th Street and 7th Avenue, and he simply says the same word all the time. And I was trying to decide if that word is a noun or a verb. I'll let you think about that. The poem is called Imperative. He's my age, the dark man leaning against this storefront window ledge, hair and beard dusted white, face impressed with a frazzled net of lines. He doesn't attempt to please, nor seem in need, but practices all day a toneless, steady neutrality, repeating his monosyllabic plea, change. In this way, he resembles a prisoner who's learned to show almost no deference to his guards, nothing of abasement. He's a barely rippling tank of dark water, superbly contained. He submits to a precise degree he's had years to gauge. Change, he says all day, fixed in his spot on seventh, the word a key he tries again, hoping this time the tumblers turn, change at night more driven, as if he meant to chip away at something. The word falling hard on the sidewalk's flint and shadow, ringing on the pavement like a dime. Many of you will remember the death of a young man named Tamir Rice. He was 12 years old. He was playing with a plastic gun in a park in Cleveland, Ohio. The, somebody who saw him called, the, called 911 and said, you know, there's a, there's a young black kid with a kid, a young black kid with a gun. I think it's a toy, but maybe you should check it out. Tamir Rice who died that day, um, actually not in the park, but in the hospital some eight hours later. I, of course, I did not know Tamir Rice. 
I could not write a poem that claimed any kind of intimacy or knowledge. What I could do was think about what happens to time when so much has fed into the creation of one individual and that is interrupted. All that legacy stops. And what about that boy's future? What, what else? Which could he have changed? What might have happened if he were in a community like this and was contributing to making things happen? So that I could talk about. This is called In Two Seconds. In two seconds, the boy's face climbed back down the 12-year tunnel of its becoming, a charcoal sunflower swallowing itself. Who has eyes to see or ears to hear? If you could see what happens fastest, unmaking the human irreplaceable, a star falling into complete gravitational darkness from all points of itself, all this, the held loved body into which entered milk and music, honeying the cells of him, who sang to him, stroked the nap of the scalp, kissed the flesh knot after the cord completed its work of fueling into him the long history of those whose suffering was made more bearable by the as yet unknown of him, playing alone in some unthinkable future city, a Cleveland, whatever that might be. Two seconds to elapse, the arc of joy in the conception bed, the labor of hands repeated until the hands no longer required attention, so that as the woman folded, her hopes for him sank into the fabric of his shirts and underpants. Down they go, swirling down into the maw of a greater dark. Treasure box, comic books, pocket knife, bell from a lost cat's collar. Why even begin to enumerate them when behind every tributary poured into him comes rushing backward all he hasn't been yet? Everything that boy could have thought or made sung or theorized, built on the quavering but continuous structure that had preceded him, sank into an absence in the shape of a boy playing with a plastic gun in the park in Ohio in the middle of the afternoon. When I say two seconds, I don't mean the time it took him to die. I mean the lapse between the instant the cruiser break to a halt in the grass, between that moment and the one in which the officer fired his weapon. The two seconds taken to assess the situation. And though I believe it is the work of art to try on at least the moment and skin of another, for this hour, I respectfully decline. I refuse it. May that officer be visited every night of his life by an enormity collapsing in front of him into an incomprehensible bloom and the voice that howls out of it. If this is no poem, then. But that voice, erased boy, beloved of time, who did nothing to no one and became nothing because of it, I know that voice is one of the things we call poetry. It isn't to his killer he's speaking. That poem was um, enormously, I I don't know, why do I want to tell you this? Um, I have always believed in the work of poetry as an empathic project an attempt to, to connect. And I think that's the first poem I've ever written which is actually a curse, and which says, I will not empathize with you. I will not enter imaginatively into that life. Because I think we need a ton. There are places we need to draw that line, huh? On behalf of all of us. So, um, this is, let's see. Oh, I know what I mean. Okay, so how, how are you holding up? You good? Yeah. You have three, three poems to come? Three poems, three, okay. Um, so, thinking about time and how time moves through us, it's, you know, time, as we all know, is anything but linear, right? Does all kinds of other things, moves in many, many ways. This is a poem that wants to think about um, living in a place, I imagine, not unlike this one, where you can live in a very old house. My, I grew up uh, some of the time in Arizona. Um, in the south and southwest, and the idea that the house was more than 10 years old was just, you know, just utterly foreign to people, right? My, my father and my stepmother could not get their head around the idea that I actually wanted a house that was built in 1810. Like, why would you, what on earth would you want that for? So, um, this is a poem that thinks about that. Can I find it? And I hope it offers another way of thinking about time besides the erasure in the previous poem. This is called Essay, The Love of Old Houses. A glow 
from rough plain floorboards, knotted and grained and chestnut hued, and flecked in the pores with bits of antique paint. Whale oil and lead for red. Was it arsenic that made this green? Remnants graced the pitted spots where the sander wouldn't reach. Well, it could have, but what we wanted when we took the burr wheel's unwieldy drum to these planks was to honor the whorls and curves that made them themselves variant, well used, like skin. Fired just now by afternoon pouring heat and honey onto these wide swaths seasoned two centuries to something durable, too much an inhabitation of warmth to qualify as inanimate, as though sunlight softened their cool human store and sent it wafting up like scent from warmed wax. I know, I am that firing light, and I'm the hand that's oiled these boards with a rosin and varnished brew, tincture that let these shallow depths emerge and last. And so what I've, we've made is not outside myself, not exactly, rather it's a container, sagging and shored, corroding and replenished, in which one doesn't need to hold oneself together, relax and oh, the rooms will do it for you. It's safe to loosen our borders here and know ourselves housed. I sanded and danished oil these floors with a man who's dead, and the planks gleam still, a visible form of vitality for you and I, love, who now revise, as each inhabitant must, the dwelling place. Making new bills upon every layer come before, we're joined to whoever wore the stair step down or cracked the corner of a window pane or waxed these boards when company was coming, which is why I like old houses best. Here it's proved that time requires a deeper, better verb than pass. It's more like pool and ebb and double back again. My history, his, yours, subsumed into the steadying frame of a phrase I love, a building. Both noun and verb, where we live and what we do. Fill it with ourselves, all the way to the walls. Proximity made bearable by separate, commingling privacies that spill and meet at the edge as clouds do, and together comprise an atmosphere our place. What else is new? A broom for you, a stack of rags for me, our own old t-shirts cut to squares and once again of use. A tin of wax, these lovely smells, tropic rosin, petroleum. So, habit um, gets a bad rep. You know, we, we have this idea that um, if we are creatures of habit, we don't see possibilities around us that we may numb ourselves. But there are, are great uses for habit. You know, do you really want to think about what kind of muffin you like every single day? You know? <laughs> or what kind of, how you like your coffee? There's something freeing about having routines. This is a poem that began when a routine of mine was disrupted, not of my own choosing. And, um, hmm, let's travel some places from there. It's also a poem that wants to think about time. Um, I live, we all, everyone in America at this moment, but also particularly gay men, live in the shadow of an epidemic, which um, not so long ago erased a great many members of my generation. Um, you don't, I don't meet a lot of gay men my age, and there's a reason for that. So the poem is thinking about being haunted, about how we carry memory, how we carry that, those lost times, keep them with us, whether we want to or not. It's called, This Your Home Now. For years, I went to the Peruvian barbers on 18th Street. Comforting, welcome, the full coat rack, three chairs held by three barbers, oldest by the window, the middle one, a slight fellow who spoke an oddly feminine Spanish, the youngest last, red-haired, self-consciously masculine, and in each of the mirrors, their children's photos, mildly smutty cartoons, postcards from Machu Picchu. I was happy in any chair though I liked best the touch of the eldest, who'd rest his hand against my neck in a thoughtless, confident way. 10 years, maybe. One day, the powdery blue steel shutters pulled down over the windows and door, not to be raised again. They'd lost their lease. I didn't know how at a loss I'd feel. This haze around what I'd like to think the sculptural presence of my skull requires neither art nor science. But two haircuts on 7th, one in Dublin, nothing right. Then, I hear my friend Marie laughing over my shoulder, saying, in your poems, there's always a then. And I think, is it a poem without a then? <laughs> Dull early winter, back on 18th, up spiraling red in a cylinder of glass, and just below the line of sidewalk, a new sign, Willie's Barbershop. Dark hallway, glass door, and there's presumably Willie, 
When I tell him I used to go down the street, he says in an inscrutable accent, this your home now. Puts me in a chair, asks me what I want, and soon he's clipping and singing with the radio's Latin dance tune. That's when I notice Willie's walls, though he's been here all the week, spangled with images hung in barbershops since the beginning of time. Lounge singers, near celebrities, random boxers, Italian boys, Puerto Rican, caught in the hour of their beauty, though they'd scowl at the word. Victors cheering over a trophy, one for what? Frames already dusty at slight angles. Here, it's clear forever. Are barbershops like aspens, each sprung from a common root 10,000 years old? <laughs> Sons of one father, flashing fighters and starlets to shield the tenderness at their hearts. Our guardian Willie defies time. His chair, our ferry boat, and we go down in the trance of touch and skull buzz drones singing cranial nerves in the direction of peace. And so I understand that in the back of this nothing building on 18th Street, I have found that door ajar before, in daylight, when it shouldn't be, some bulb left burning in a fathomless shaft of my uncharted nights. The men I have outlived await their turns, the fevered and wasted whose mothers and lovers scattered their ashes and gave away their clothes. 20 years, and their names tumble into a numb well, though in truth I have not forgotten one of you, may I never forget one of you, these layers of men arrayed in their no longer breathing ranks. Willie, I have not lived well in my grief for them. I have lugged this weight from place to place as though it were mine to account for. And today I sit in your good chair in the sixth decade of my life. And if your back door is a threshold of the kingdom of the lost, yours is a steady hand on my shoulder. Go down into the still waters of this chair and come up refreshed, ready to face the avenue. Maybe I do believe we will not be left comfortless. After everything comes tumbling down or you tear it down and stumble in the shadow valley trenches of the moon, there's still a decent chance that a barbershop, salsa on the radio, the instruments of renewal wielded effortlessly. And who'd have thought? For you. Willie, if he is Willie, fusses much longer over my head than my head merits, which allows me to be grateful without qualification. Could I be a little satisfied? There's a man who loves me, our dogs, 15, 20 more good years if I'm a bit careful. This is what I haven't written. It's sunny out, though cold. After I tip Willie, I'm going down to Jane Street, to a coffee shop I like, and then I'm going to write this poem. Then... Thank you. Right. So, okay, so if you can stand that, I'm going to finish with one new poem. Uh, it is a little different. It's a prose poem, which a uh, form I never make use of, but it just felt I needed something different for this particular thing. Um, this is a poem that wants to think about the renewal of possibility that um, you could be far along in the journey of your life and you could actually fall in love. Wow, what? <laughs> fall in love like the way you fell in love when you were 20? Like that kind of fall? But better. It's called The Summons. Suppose you made a taxonomy of kisses in their vast variety. The kiss on the cheek of a child heading out for the day. The kiss on the forehead you give a friend departing after she's unburdened herself in a long conversation. The complex vocabulary of kisses between the long coupled who signal through them a host of things. But those aren't the kisses you really want to study. Could you name the kisses of lovers, distinguish their nuances, the shades of passion? You would like to do the research for this. Then you realize it's what you have been doing, what you are doing, what you plan to do. In the great album of kisses, the master text, there would have to be so much room. The sorts of kisses which are invitations, their degree of fervor indicating greater urgency or intensity. The lips shut small kiss you give to the lips of a man heading out your door in the morning when you don't plan to see him more than just this once. And you know he's already made the same decision. The different sort of closed lips small kiss you give him when it's his apartment you're leaving. Is there room in the imaginarium for the kisses you've withheld? Because they wouldn't have been welcomed? or you were afraid they would be welcome and promised too much, and then you'd somehow have to make room for that? Or the kiss withheld because you knew someone wanted it and you weren't about to give him that? When he used to kiss me, I felt he was hitting my mouth, striking at me with his teeth beneath his lips. Why didn't I stop him? My mother's kiss, when it came, always seemed to bring a small disturbance of air carrying her sense, a floral soap from Mexico, lipstick, coffee, a bracing whiff from the mouth of a just opened bottle of vodka. The first time I kissed, we were standing on a fire escape at night behind an old hotel, and there were freight cars moving on the tracks beneath us, tracks that spread in all directions into the snow. 
you're just warming up to the one kiss you really want to talk about. When that kiss comes, it doesn't matter that you've known him for a few years in an easy way, lightweight, pleasant, something breezy about it, as he blew in now and then on a wind arrived from a climate where gravity doesn't work as hard as it does in New York. He always seemed young, not especially attached, so perhaps that's because he just hasn't told you much. You always like him, his freshness and his enthusiasm, which is why you keep seeing him again, though the expectation is just for a few bright hours. And then, as we say, out of the blue, out of nowhere, without anything obvious changing, something shifts, clearly, like the atmosphere after a storm, magnetic charge, ions, something in the clockworks. There's a newly opened space, an aperture in which the kiss can take place. You're lying together, face to face and half undressed. You've done this many times, but the unexpected way your torsos fall into each other, unwilled, is the overture, and as your faces come together, the kiss, before it's a kiss, is a fuse that begins a long burn, a nearly visible black sparkle, traversing more distance than you'd imagine, coiling its way through the space between you in two directions, into his chest as well as into yours. Hello, light and heat. Hello, nextness. And then his beauty laid out like an entire field of candles in yellow grass. You saw it before, but never saw it. Not all lit like this. Hello. His beauty, an explosion inside a clear room at the bottom of the ocean. The shockwave just now reaching you. Beauty, the defining character of his body, but not resident there only, connected instead to something larger above him. Free-floating cloud, suddenly ours in common, spilling down into you until you're lit up also, a cove of small waves created by phosphorus. <coughs> the kiss is immense. Although you understand at once, not a thought exactly, more a felt sensation, that its intimacy is what allows for this tremendous scale. Does the kiss even have an edge? It goes on in every way. Why would you want it to stop, except to take stock a second, to catch your breath, so you can dive into that wave again, and go under, and dive again? It takes a while to know that the space in which you live, the element in which your body moves, has changed. From here on out, with each immersion, you are less contained. To be that desired, what is that? To have that opening, that entrance awaiting you, to know it's there, to dissolve the edges of you, that, isn't just the, that it isn't just the mouth, just the body that is opened by the kiss. From the first moment, you know that the kiss is a fact, as real as this table and chair, both utter promise and total trouble. If this is in the world, this possibility, if you know the address of such a place for the flaming meadow and the glowing wavelets dwell in the late hours together, where his beauty is a solvent in which you both are dissolved and remade in the crazy furnace of the kiss, why would you want to be anywhere else? It's an imperative, a summons, a bell. And what are you going to do about that? Thank you all. This is great. Mark Doty, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mark. What a reading. Hmm. Right here in Funny Little Mystic, huh? Thanks also to Andrew Willis, wherever you are, Andrew, and John L. Stanisi. Thank you for your wonderful poems. We have some of Mark Doty's books on sale tonight, which I'm sure he'd be glad to sign for you. Wonderful books, books that will move you, perhaps change your life. I commend to you particularly this wonderful masterwork, Fire to Fire. And I should also commend to you my favorite Mark Doty book, which is not even a book of his great poems, but is a, well, it's like no other book I've read. It's called Still Life with Oysters and Lemon. Check it out. Um, thank you. Come back in May, please.